Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is KP Fabian. It gives me much pleasure to welcome you to our webinar on the civil war in Ethiopia on behalf of the India International Center from New Delhi, where the air quality index is 225 in Mayur Vihar, where I am right now. It is a program division headed by Tete, who has brought us together in cyberspace. Thank you, Tete, even as you choose to be invisible. We have a distinguished panel composed of uh, Professor Kurivala Matthews, Ambassador Gurjit Singh, and Dr. John Cherian. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to permit me to share a few thought, one thought or two with you. Let us look at the title. Civil war in Ethiopia. Tell me, is there anything civil about a war? So why do we call it civil war? Well, of course, it means what is happening inside. But nevertheless, you know, there cannot be anything civil about a war. Obviously, we human beings do not always get morally outraged with what we do to our fellow human beings. Now, coming to Ethiopia, an ancient civilization, we all have heard of Hune uh, of Sheba, who went to see King Solomon and asked him a few riddles before agreeing to marry him. The first riddle was, what are the seven that issue and nine that enter, the two that offer drink and the one that drinks? I will not answer it because you know the answer. Now we also have heard of Hail Selassie. He had lions as pets. They used to run around in the palace. Once the Indian ambassador who had just presented his credentials at the palace was asked by the emperor whether he, the ambassador, was scared of the lions. The ambassador replied, Your Majesty, I do not see lions. I only see the lion of Judah. Because the emperor's, one of his titles was the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Now that was in 1916. It was Ambassador Rajwadi, who was Joint Secretary Administration when I joined. Now, let me share with you a more recent story. Our ambassador presented his credentials to Colonel Mengistu, who overthrew the emperor. Our ambassador detected a Kerala accent in the way Colonel Mengistu spoke. The conversation was in English. Well, without asking him directly about the accent, our ambassador was able to uh, find out from Mengistu himself that he had teachers from India. Now, it was the emperor who, while on a visit to India, asked the then Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, for teachers from India. Well, Lots of teachers went from India and in Indone in Ethiopia, I have been told that, uh, you know, for them, every Indian, so to say, is a teacher. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is not a pre-cooked meal. The distinguished panelists have indicated that they each will speak for about 10 minutes to leave time for the Q&A the most important part of the IIC webinar. Now there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen, right hand side. You may like to write down and send the questions. If you choose, you can address your questions to a particular panelist. 
Now, dear friends, let us request Professor Kurivula Matthews to address us. He is professor at, or he has been professor at Addis Ababa for, uh, I believe, 14 or 15 years, during which time he has guided many for their uh, post, uh, PhD. Professor Matthews, some time back, and IIC President Sri N. N. Vora had edited an impressive volume on Africa, India, and South-South cooperation. That was in 1997. Happily for us, Professor Matthews is now in Delhi. Over to you, Professor Matthews. Thank you, Ambassador Fabian, Ambassador Gurjit Singh, uh, uh, Mr. John Cherian, I can't see him, and all present to listen to. Uh, in fact, the Civil War in Ethiopia about which uh, a lot is talked about and we are here to uh, discuss something about uh, the, the origins, the causes and uh, the consequences of the civil war. Um, I, I think it is, uh, uh, it is something which uh, happened to persuade me to be here today. I mean, in fact, uh, two months back, Taking leave from my teaching, I came to India, not because of the civil war, but because of, uh, you know, just for a holiday. But the civil war has uh, kept me longer than expected, and that's why I'm here. And I'm happy uh, not uh, exactly to participate in the, uh, in the discussion on an important uh, topic, of course, uh, but at the same time uh, to here and maybe what people are thinking about uh, what is happening in Ethiopia. I think it is, uh, everyone knows, uh, in fact, because of some reasons, uh, uh, because of also uh, uh, some unfavorable uh, health conditions, I haven't been able to uh, do any preparation for, uh, uh, you know, following up the civil war that is going on. Of course, it is going on for the last, uh, little over a year. Uh, in fact, uh, Ethiopia is not, uh, everyone knows, Ethiopia is not uh, uh, new to civil wars. There have been civil wars in the past. There have been civil wars uh, uh, in the 1970s, in 1974, the emperor was overthrown. Now, if I, I, I may, uh, you know, read out from some paper which I recently wrote uh, on Ethiopia's role uh, in the in the global scene, not necessarily on the uh, Ethiopia is a multi, I mean, as everyone knows, Ethiopia is a multi-ethnic state that is located in the northeastern Africa, also known as the Horn of Africa. Uh, its population, which is composed of uh, around 83 ethnic groups, is estimated to be uh, 115 million, uh, where uh, the youth constitute 60 percent of the total population. Economically, Ethiopia's economy is predominantly agrarian, in which nearly 85% of the population are engaged uh, in agricultural activities, whereas trade, industry, service sectors uh, constitute the remaining 15% of. Uh, in connection with the adoption of the developmental, uh, developmental state approach, Ethiopia has managed in recent years to record a double digit economic growth. As a result, the country has advanced itself from one of uh, the poorest economy to one of the uh, one of the fastest growing economies in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, I should add here that uh, there is a gentle impression that Ethiopia uh, talked about in terms of uh, its uh, ancient history and what has been happening and the civil wars. And very little, in fact, is probably uh, talked about uh, at the present day Ethiopia. Uh, and now, uh, talking about Ethiopia, uh, politically, uh, since first century AD to 1974, Ethiopia is used to be ruled by monarchs who trace their origins from King Solomon of Israel. Then 
1974, a socialist military dictatorship was established by the Darug regime, uh, uh, again uh, after the civil war. Uh, after 17 years of brutal rule, which uh, uh, which was or which is characterized by gross human rights violations, uh, state terrorism, and the suppression of political pluralism, the direct regime was overthrown by uh, by the People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, that's called the EPRDF in May 1991. The EPRDF reconfigured the political landscape of a country by introducing an ethnic-based federal arrangement. I should stress ethnic-based federal arrangement that empowered ethnic groups, uh, ethnic groups to enjoy the right to self-determination and uh, up to secession from the uh, 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 from the state. Accordingly, the country was divided into ten regional states and two city administrations. Uh, through the 1995 Federal Democratic Republic of uh, though sorry though the 1995 Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia constitution proclaimed a democratic order. EPRDF's three decade rule 1992 to 2018 has been characterized by an electoral electoral authoritarianism in which uh, the incumbent party emerged as uh, uh, as a victor uh, to all local uh, in all local and uh, uh, general elections uh, from 1992 to 2015 almost 30 years consequently Popular protest swelled in late 2015, um, recently, uh, driven by frustration uh, over government tactics that denied Ethiopian basic civil and political rights, as well as uh, complaints by, uh, by the country's two largest ethnic groups, the Oromo and the Amhara, which constitute the majority, uh, that they had long been shut shut out of power by the Tigray minority and dominated uh, dominated the ruling coalition. After a series of uh, protests that continued until April 2018 and uh, the simmering elite division, elite division within the ruling coalition, the EPRDF selected Dr. Abiy Ahmed uh, as a new as the new prime minister replacing Haley Mariam Dasalin, who uh, who replaced a uh, well-known Meles Senavi, uh, incidentally a good friend of our former ambassador, uh, Dr. Gurjit Singh, uh, who resigned uh, in February 2018 due to a popular pressure. Dasalin resigned and Abi Ahmed uh, comes to power. Since April 2018, April 2018, Prime Minister Abi Ahmed uh, has undertaken significant uh, reform measures that include releasing political prisoners, unlocking hundreds of websites, revising draconian laws, uh, uh, returning uh, uh, draconian laws, returning exiled opposition figures and organizations and liberalizing the media landscape. However, the transition is not immune from uh, shortcomings like uh, intercommunal violence, mass displacements and simmering ethnic tension. In fact, ethnic tension, I would say more than other factors. Uh, political tensions escalated when the election that was scheduled to be held uh, uh, in May 2020 According to the Ethiopian constitution, elections are held every every five years, and it has been going on for uh, for the last uh, thirty years almost without any problem. Uh, was postponed uh, due to COVID nineteen pandemic. As a result, the constitutional crisis that stemmed from the postponement of the twenty twenty election last year, uh, the legitimacy of the federal government was challenged by Tigray region though the House of Federation and the Parliament uh, took official measures to uh, retain the current administration until the next elections 
uh, to be held as soon as the pandemic uh, subsumes. Following Tigray's, uh, uh, Tigray region's decision uh, to hold, unconstitution hold the unconstitutional election by defying the decision of the federal government, tensions escalated and led to a military a military confrontation that commenced uh, on 4th November 2020. So that is when uh, the uh, the current uh, uh, crisis or the civil war in uh, uh, Ethiopia starts. Currently, even though the federal government uh, reclaimed the Tigray region by defeating the TPLF standing army, uh, still the conflict is not, uh, not yet concluded. With regard to Ethiopia's engagement, uh, uh, Ethiopia's engagement with the extra, I mean, I, I will not go into uh, the, the historical details to which uh, 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 to which Ambassador Fabian. Uh, and in this context, uh, uh, I would uh, uh, I, I would only uh, conclude uh, 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 conclude that at the present uh, the present crisis. The present civil war in Ethiopia uh, has uh, uh, has its own uh, its own dimensions, and of course, most often, whether it is civil war, whether it is in the U.S. civil war or the Chinese civil war or Russian civil war or any civil war, you'll find that there are certain fundamental causes that cause the civil war. In the case of uh, uh, to um, uh, you know make the story short. In the case of uh, the Ethiopian civil war, I think the the underlying cause is uh, uh, is that a small minority that represent the Tigrians that represent about uh, six percent of the population has been controlling has been uh, in you know uh, uh, not only controlling has been getting uh, getting rich and enjoying the fruits of independence for the last thirty years. And it is only after the death of Meles Senavi in 2015, and then uh, the crisis, uh, uh, you know, dissatisfaction comes into the open, and his uh, deputy, the uh, Salen Haley Mariam, uh, taking uh, up the uh, uh, reins of the state and becoming prime minister. Of course, he also had to uh, resign because of uh, uh, because of. Uh, popular pressure, and then it is in that context you come to the most important date in recent years of uh, Ethiopian history. That is the coming of uh, Abi Ahmed, I mean, who has been an uh, army uh, person himself, and who uh, who became and who was not who became, I should say, who was uh, elected prime minister in. Uh, uh, in 20, uh, in 2018, and in 2018, and Abiy Ahmed, as most all of you will know, I am Abi Ahmed comes uh, from the Oromo ethnic groups, uh, which constitute about 36 percent of the population, as against the six percent of the Tigray population, and this necessarily led to a uh, an eruption of ambitions and uh, the Oromo, which has been uh, sort of uh, uh, the uh, neglected the section of and the majority of the Ethiopians, they decided to sort of uh, uh, try to uh, uh, try to take steps, and it is this which led uh, uh, in uh, uh, on the twentieth of July, uh, twenty twenty. Uh, to a sort of a clash between the uh, between the Tigrayan forces and uh, the federal forces in uh, uh, in Mekele in 2020, uh, to be precise, uh, November November 4, 2020. And since uh, November 4, 2020, I think as uh, all of you might be uh, familiar, the present civil war has been uh, has been going on. Uh, and uh, of course, the, uh, a lot of things have been happening. I was uh, trying to follow it uh, myself, uh, uh, but that, uh, I mean, uh, it is in the midst of the civil war. Also, I came uh, to Delhi on holidays. While the country uh, and the citizens uh, 
have been uh, uh, preparing for uh, for the fight worried about the immediate attack uh, immediate attack us and uh, uh, other countries also uh, and its residents started leaving the country and the country of course uh, has been in a sort of a uh, turmoil uh, for the last uh, last many months uh, and of course in this uh, uh, civil war as uh, uh, most of you will know uh, many uh, foreign powers were also involved for uh, their own reasons and uh, 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 this uh, uh, has been affecting the country, the country's economy and the people. And uh, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, many uh, suggestions for, uh, uh, there have been a lot of proposals for uh, ending the civil war through negotiation, but uh, uh, for some reason or the other, that has not yet uh, uh, so far happened. Uh, only we can, uh, we can hope that this uh, civil war comes to. Uh, the latest information as I get uh, from the news is that uh, uh, so far, or at the moment, the government is, uh, the government forces, uh, the prime minister himself is uh, right in the, uh, in the forefront. The government forces are uh, getting the upper hand, but there is no, uh, uh, no clear, uh, no clear sort of uh, guidelines or clear uh, uh, modalities of bringing the civil war to an end. And uh, 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 in fact, uh, the, uh, one can talk about uh, what has been happening about uh, uh, the various uh, 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 developments that have been taking place in the country, the involvement of the foreign powers, uh, etc. But uh, since uh, I think uh, uh, there are other speakers and uh, I was told uh, 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 to limit uh, to 10 to 15 minutes maximum. So I will stop here and uh, 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 I'm sure there may be a bit uh, discussion and uh, you may have questions to ask and I'll come back at that time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Matthews, uh, for that insightful intervention. You took us. Uh, to EPRDF in the 1990s, and then you guided us uh, to what is happening right now. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now request uh, Ambassador Gurdjit Singh, uh, who was uh, India's ambassador to Ethiopia from 2005 to 2009. What I have noticed about my colleague and friend is that uh, he is very Teutonic that is thorough in his method and uh, uh, well when i said teutonic you know of course he was our ambassador to germany but the point is he was teutonic even before he went to germany and he remains teutonic even after he has left germany the other day i read a very insightful piece by him uh, on what is happening in ethiopia over to you ambassador gurjitsi Thank you very much, Ambassador Fabian, and my uh, you and IIC honor me by inviting me to this distinguished panel with Professor Matthews and Dr. John Cherian. Uh, uh, my heart is indeed heavy, and what has happened to my beloved Ethiopia is quite unbelievable that one of the most civilizational countries in Africa is today butchering itself and its own people, a country whose main thought was to talk about the grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It is only dammed now. There is no Renaissance. There is no power. Willfully shut down power, telecommunications, food to its own people. And the suffering is not only in Tigray. It is in several parts of Ethiopia. How a country whose leader won the Nobel Peace Prize is in a most brutal war and how a country who transformed from the EPRDF to the prosperity party is facing this situation are the conundrums which continue to baffle us. Let me try and briefly explain why I think 
the civil war broke out. We keep talking about the Tigray minority. It is the Tigrayans who liberated Ethiopia from Mengistu's Dirk. Everybody else mostly watched. The, the, it was the TPLF which led and came to the doors of Addis Ababa and waited there for a few days so that Isaias Afewarki could liberate Asmara in, in Eritrea. Eritrea was a part of Ethiopia. Secondly, the largest people, the Oromo, they are the ones who rose in revolt and brought the regime of Haile Mariam Desalen to an impasse, due to which the EPRDF had to draft in a new leader to settle this huge rebellion. And they picked who they thought was an Oromo leader, Abi Ahmed. Abi Ahmed was not a senior EPRDF leader. He was not even the president of the Oromo region. He was the deputy. But he was drafted in because he was the youthful reformer who could lead Ethiopia out of the morass it had been. And he started so well. But where I think the mistake took place is that Abi Ahmed's reforms, whether they be domestic or they be the outreach to Eritrea, tended to isolate the Tigrayan party, which, as Professor Matthew said, had run Ethiopia for 30 years. The TPLF lost faith in Abi when he launched the Prosperity Party and refused to be a part of it. And re realizing that perhaps they could all be targeted, they all retreated to Mekele. Now, the first mistake, according to me, is by the current government in not trying to take the TPLF along, even by bending backwards. Second mistake is of the TPLF by retreating to Mekele in a shell and setting up this border between them and Addis Ababa. Third mistake, attacking the military headquarters. This was a call to war. Now, today, our subject is civil war. But when on 4th November 2020, the action was launched, it was called a law and order operation. A law and order operation is what India undertook in Hyderabad in 1947. Okay, So if that got out of hand, you would have civil war. So this is what has happened here. The law and order action has got out of hand. So today you have a situation where there is no military victory for the Addis Ababa forces. There is no military victory for the TPLF, who have since aligned with their arch enemies, the Oromo Liberation Army, and there is no military victory for them. So I think in, if you want to see peace return to this wonderful land, you will have to let all of them uh, exhaust themselves on the battlefield. This is actually self-defeating. What you have today is a demand for a ceasefire by everybody. The Europeans, the Americans, the Security Council, the AU, everybody wants a ceasefire. But there is no ceasefire and the conditions for a ceasefire put by the TPLF and by the uh, Addis Ababa government are both almost mutually exclusive. But I believe that along with the ceasefire, you also need an arms embargo because it is new weaponry coming in from Turkey, UAE, possibly China, which is now bolstering the debilitated strength of the Addis Ababa government. How you are going to continue to fight people and till how many do you need to kill before you get down to talk? In this country today, millions of people are displaced, 400,000 are in abject starvation and yet, there is so much distrust that humanitarian aid is a matter of contention now. The Addis Ababa government believes that the TPLF weaponizes humanitarian aid. The TPLF in turn believes that their population is being starved by Addis Ababa into submission. So this is a bad situation. Third, 
there is so much hate speech and othering today to be a tigre and even at Addis Ababa means you will be rounded up and ghettoized and possibly sent off to a camp well outside Addis Ababa. Now this has become such a difficult situation for people who were friends and who were neighbors. Please understand that though Ethiopia has ethnic federalism, there was intermarriage between Muslims and Christians of all denominations. Now we are thinking of Abi Ahmed as Oromo. In practice, Abi Ahmed comes from a Muslim father and a Protestant mother and himself is Pentecostal. This is typical Ethiopia. This is the Ethiopia that we knew. Syncretic, united, all people, you know, traditions live together. And this is what is being massacred today. The, I would also like to speak about the role of other powers. The engagement with Eritrea, the TPLF believes, was with the purpose of curtailing their role. And uh, now, you need not believe the conspiracy theory, but the way the civil war turned out, the Eritreans have been evidently the most brutal as per the Ethiopian and UN Human Rights Report. It is the friends in Addis Ababa say, Ethiopia, Eritreans are all over Addis Ababa running the show. So you have to remember in the whole of Ethiopia, Eritrea and Ethiopia are cousins, sorry, uh, Tigrayans are cousins. They are similar, they are efficient, and they are determined. That is why even though Tigrayans were only 6%, they could rule for 30 years. They simply have seemed to be replaced by Eritreans. That is why today everybody, including the UN Security Council, calls for Eritreans to leave Ethiopia. Final thing, what can we do now? Evidently, the political question is one of federalism. The TPLF believes that when you try and dismantle ethnic federalism, you are trying to reduce their role to numbers, meaning those who are more numerous will have a bigger say in power and because they are 6%, they will count for less. Other, so therefore, they say Abi Ahmed is a unitarist. He's not a federalist. But if you talk to people in the Ethiopian diaspora, they say this is a wrong binary. It is not that. It is a question, why should a federation only be an ethnic federation? True, India is not an ethnic federation. India is more or less a linguistic federation. There are so many federations in the world. So the question of federalism will be the one to be debated, but not in these circumstances. You have to have a rational way of debating it. And let me end with an aside here. Prime Minister Melis in his heart knew that the monarchist way in which the Amara ruled for centuries cannot be the survival of Ethiopia. He came to India to attend the Forum of Federations meeting in 2007, I think. Later, he was so enamored with the Forum of Federation that he invited them to host their next meeting, maybe 2011, in Addis Ababa. So he wanted to learn more and more about Federation. And he spoke to me so many times about how Indian federalism works. And he liked Indian federalism because he said, you are a federation with unitary features. And that is the kind of federation which Ethiopia can possibly use. He had told me clearly, ethnic federalism of 1995 was a stepping stone. But I believe that they did not reform enough, fast enough, or in a timely manner. And they got too used to the, uh, you know, frills of power. Meles died in 2012, Professor Matthews, not 2015. And since then, Haile Mariam Desalen took over and won a new election in 2015 as the Prime Minister. Haile Mariam Desalen led EPRDF to an independent victory. And in 2020, Abiy Ahmed has led Prosperity Party to a new victory. 
So these questions will remain. Now people say that the prosperity party is unitary. Of all accounts, the party is unitary. But they don't seem to think that the country needs to be unitary. In fact, since Abi Ahmed came, a new state has been created, Sidama, out of the southern people. So today you are now gone to 10 states and two, uh, you know, regional states. So we are in a very difficult situation. And I think we need to remember that the only new states in Africa born after World War II are all in this region. Eritrea peacefully through secession from Ethiopia, 1993. South Sudan, not so peacefully breaking away from Sudan, 2011. And now from all accounts, Somaliland is ready to breach the defenses of Somalia. Can we allow Tigray to separate itself from Ethiopia? My answer is we should not be going down that route. Ethiopia, the world needs it as a stabilizing force in the Horn of Africa with a syncretic positive culture. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Gujit Singh. Uh, your presentation is indeed a study in lucidity and brevity. You have told us how under the Nobel Peace Prize winning Prime Minister, we are where we are in Ethiopia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us request uh, Dr. John Cherian, consulting editor of the Frontline to address us. She doesn't need any introduction. We don't need uh, any, uh, we don't, I don't need to introduce uh, Dr. John Cherian because he has been uh, addressing us in the IAC forum often. But uh, I should mention one thing that is, uh, I have been telling uh, my students, those who prepare for the civil service, that if you want to succeed, then you have to read Dr. John Cherian in the front line to find out what is happening in the international realm. Over to you, Dr. John Cherian. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Fabian. I am in the company of such distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, Professor Matthews was my senior in the School of International Studies. Am I audible? I'm not visible, I know, but I'm audible. You are audible, but not visible. But uh, you are audible. Okay. Audible. Okay. Yeah, so, and uh, Ambassador Gurjit Singh, who uh, talked to us about his first hand experiences when he served as ambassador in Ethiopia. Uh, such a pleasure being in such illustrious company. Uh, first, first of all, let me confess, you know, you know, I have a bit of a soft corner for uh, Mengistu Hele Mariam, not a very fashionable thing to say. But one should remember, he was one man who tried to keep Ethiopia intact. And he only fell after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, after the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, he fought against, uh, you know, divisive forces in Ethiopia. You should, one should not forget the war against uh, Somalia. Uh, the Somali in those Somalia in those days was aligned with uh, the United States during the Cold War period, and uh, they launched an attack against Ethiopia. And uh, Mengistu, with the help of the Cubans, succeeded in defeating the Somali. And after that. The Americans and the West, they encouraged the, uh, the Eritreans and the Tigrayans in, their, in the civil war. And they could only win this war after the collapse of, uh, of the East Bloc. And what is very interesting is that Ethiopia is the only country, I mean, the, the TPLF, they allowed Ethiopia to be split so, uh, to such an extent that Ethiopia, the, had to give up its entire uh, coastline. So Ethiopia was left, uh, it, was, it became a landlocked country. So this just, you know, as a background, you know, of what is happening today. Uh, and once uh, Eritrea was allowed to uh, become a separate country, the relationship with the Tigrayans uh, soon broke down. And I think, I mean, uh, many analysts also think uh, that it is the TPLF which, uh, uh, fought this war against the uh, uh, against the Eritreans, 
although the United Nations and the International Tribunal had marked a border dividing uh, Ethiopia with Eritrea, a land, a, de a land border in a desolate area. But the, uh, the TPLF uh, leadership refused to uh, you know, concede. And they fought this bloody war, which of course ended in a stalemate. And, uh, and one reason why Abiy was given the Nobel Peace Prize was uh, because he made that famous trip to Asmara to meet with the Eritrean leadership and, and, the, uh, and peace was established between the two countries. And another thing one should not forget is that the TPLF ruled with an iron hand. Professor Matthews would know the massacre about the massacre on, in the University of Addis Ababa, where I believe about 250 students were massacred. And elections uh, before Abi came were more or less a sham. The opposition was not allowed to really compete. I'm not saying that the elections held uh, this year were, uh, you know, above board. Uh, but they were much more fairer, and uh, the African Union also gave a clean certificate to that uh, election, which was held this year. Now, I was told, uh, I, uh, Mr. Fabian suggested that I should speak about uh, what the international community is uh, doing. Uh, the, United, uh, the UN uh, Security Council, as everybody knows, uh, is split. Of course, the UN Secretary General issued a very strong statement uh condemning the bloodshed and the and asked for an immediate ceasefire and, uh, but uh, russia and china for all practical purposes i mean they are with the central government in addis ababa they are supporting the addis ababa government while the united states uh, france and the uk are sitting on the fence and actually if the uh, government in addis is to be believed they are supporting the separatists, the, Tig the Tigrayan separatists. In fact, today the uh, government in Addis Ababa issued a very strong st uh, statement uh, criticizing the United States, uh, saying that the United States, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they, they, the U.S. State Department and the Europeans uh, also issued a statement saying that uh, blaming the, uh, the central government for targeting minorities after the state of emergency was declared. Uh, so the Ethiopian government is saying that the United States is not treating both the uh, parties as equals, the state as well as a separatist group who have risen in revolt. And uh, the Biden administration allowed the Tigrayan uh, opposition and the uh, other the, uh, and groups like the Oromo Liberation Front to hold a press conference in Washington. Uh, they're, they're one of the top leaders of the, uh, of the Tigray. Uh, TPLF was allowed to organize a press conference. The media was invited. And, uh, uh, you know, generally uh, asking for help. And the, uh, they demanded that the Ethiopian government concede to, uh, to many of the demands of the separatists. Uh, this was interpreted in Addis Ababa as a sort of, uh, you know, implicit support by the uh, uh, by the Biden administration to the uh, uh, Tigrayan uh, group. Also, I think uh, Washington uh, uh, as owes a debt of gratitude to the Tigrayans, uh, to the uh, former government, because they were the ones uh, who sent the army to Somalia when the Al-Shabaab-led uh, uh, movement there took power briefly. They captured the capital. And at that time, Al-Shabaab was not as radical as it is now. I mean, the leadership was also uh, much more moderate. But anyway, the Ethiopians sent in their forces and uh, helped in, uh, in squashing the uh, Al-Shabaab. And you know what the result today uh, is in Somalia. Somalia is in uh, you know, a total turmoil. And the Al Shabaab is actually on the ascendant. Now, the, uh, what did the African Union do? Uh, the African Union first uh, uh, tried to uh, um, uh, they, they nominated three former heads of state to go to uh, Addis to uh, uh, and and to the Tigray region to uh, find a solution. 
but they were rebuffed you know, by the government in Addis. Now the African Union has appointed the former president of uh, Nigeria, uh, who was also a former general, Olusegun Obasanjo, to mediate. He, have, he was there uh, last month. Uh, he, he shuttled between uh, the uh, region and uh, Addis, but uh, I, I believe the Tigrayans uh, do not. Uh, uh, sort of, they, they, they think that uh, Abbas Sanjo is really not a neutral negotiator because uh, the African Union had uh, issued some statements uh, which were quite supportive of the government in, uh, in Addis Ababa. They, so they said that the elections which were held in June were fair and free and were very credible. So that, uh, that effort has also not uh, succeeded. So. Uh, yesterday, the Ethiopian government made a statement, and uh, it has not been denied by the Tigrayans also that the two uh, cities on the way, uh, which are about 200 kilometers away from Addis Ababa, situated on the main road uh, leading to Djibouti, from where Ethiopia exports, exports and imports most of its, uh, you know, uh, most of the exports and imports are done. Uh, so that those cities have been recaptured and I think that the uh, Ethiopian military is on the ascendant and the Tigrayans are now uh, sort of retreating. So, but all the same, the conflict in Ethiopia it can have a big impact on the entire uh, horn uh, of Africa region. Uh, or, or last week there was a clash between uh, the, the Sudanese uh, uh, and the Ethiopian uh, army, in which uh, Sudan claims that ten of the soldiers were killed, and uh, and the Sudanese uh, are, uh, government and Sudan itself is in is in turmoil, and the Sudanese uh, government is having problems with uh, with Ethiopia. They have a border dispute, and as well as the dispute over the uh, Great Renaissance Dam. Sudan and Egypt are threatening military action against um, uh, against Addis, for, uh, and the Americans also uh, are supporting um, um, Egypt and Sudan on the on the dam issue. The Trump administration had in in fact cut aid uh, to uh, to uh, to the Ethiopian government on this issue, and also I believe. The, uh, the Americans are not very happy with the strong relationship Ethiopia has cultivated with uh, with China. The Chinese are one of the are one of the biggest financiers of uh, of the dam, and also they have uh, invested a lot in the infrastructural uh, program uh, in uh, Ethiopia. A new rail link, you know, you know connects. Uh, uh, to Djibouti, I don't know. I think it's from Addis, but. Uh, so all this, so the Americans, uh, you know, are, uh, are, as I said, are sitting on the fence. And then there was a, a leaked video uh, which, uh, uh, which showed that former top U.S. State Department uh, talking about ways and means of supporting the Tigrayans. Uh, this video has also upset the uh, the uh, government in Ethiopia. So, uh, you know, the conflict in Ethiopia could have a very serious impact on uh, on the uh, on the region and uh, could uh, the entire region could break up as a result of this uh, war. Have I got any more time? Uh, I think I should stop with this. And uh, also, I, I just read that the Chinese and the Emiratis and uh, um, the Saudis are now uh, sort of interceding on the side of the central government. So, and the Eritreans are officially not involved, but the Eritrean uh, soldiers are there, but they are uh, sort of, uh, you know, they are being paid to fight in the, in the war against the, the Tigrayans. 
and uh, one should never forget that the tigrains uh, are, you know when i've been mean, are very unpopular with the, in the rest of uh, ethiopia because they still remember the brutal the brutality uh, the, their brutal rule you know since 1991 uh, 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 and so i don't think they can ever make a comeback uh, uh, you know they can they can never rule the whole of uh, ethiopia so I don't think the people will tolerate that anymore. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. John Cherian. Uh, thank you for telling us why the Security Council, which is, uh, you know, which has a responsibility to maintain peace and security, has failed to act so far. You also drew attention to, you know, the dam and uh, other things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, let me find out with your permission, because uh, I was told earlier that uh, we might be able to hear from uh, Ms. Aparna Mehrotra, uh, who is among the audience. Uh, uh, yes, I think I can see her. Ah, now I can see her. I was about to say that uh, I can say that she is there. Well, Aparna, welcome. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, what happens in a conflictual situation is that uh, scholars talk about which power is winning, which power is losing. But most of the time, we lose sight of what is happening to human beings. And... Uh, it's very important to find out what is happening to human beings, especially to women and children who are non-combatants. And, uh, you know, so Aparna, who is a senior official, a director in the UN for UN Women, she is uh, based in New York, but fortunately she happens to be with us uh, in Delhi. So she has agreed to address us uh, for a short while. Over to you, Aparna. Thank you, everybody. And um, it's somewhat daunting to come after some wonderful experts and with um, so much interesting analysis and actual knowledge. But I would like really to speak, you know, just to bring to your attention, you know, what happens to women who are 51% of the population, I just want to, you know, um, inform people about the frameworks that guide these issues a little bit so that there is an understanding that, you know, when people speak about the need for um, looking at the status of women in, also, in particular in conflict, because it, it is always mostly, you know, um, male predominated and dominated and the women then have to bear the brunt of it because many men die and whether it's starvation or whether it's the war itself it's in the end the solutions uh, and of keeping the country running and of keeping people fed if it, and of all the consequences including dealing with issues of weapons of war which is which take the form of sexual violence and rape you know, these affect women and you almost feel like it's the women who are left bearing the brunt of the wars that they didn't start. So I just want to say that in the case of, um, you know, there is, there are international commitments uh, to address gender related violence, which has been particularly bad by all sides in the in also in Ethiopia. In fact, the High Commissioner for Women for Human Rights, who was president of Chile before, um, she actually has, you know, spoken to this effect and noted that the incitement to hatred and discrimination has been very well documented actually um, in this civil war and that you actually have um, you know, uh, an escalation of the use of, of rape as a weapon of war um, by all sides. So, you know, you not only have the issues that are being addressed um, 
in terms of power politics, you know, the Americans support this, the Chinese support that, the AB government supports this, does that, etc., Tigrans, etc. But it's equally important to understand what it is that they're doing to women and what and what happens to these human beings. And this is why I think it's important to understand and remember always that there are Security Council resolutions, such as your Security Council Resolution 1960, which provides an accountability system for conflict-related sexual violence, and it stipulates that coordinated and timely collection of information on such um, violence is required. Uh, right now, it's difficult uh, even to get information on this. And Security Council Resolution 2122 sets out the need for humanitarian aid, in particular to ensure access to sexual and reproductive health services, including pregnancies resulting from rape. Now, I want to say this because, you know, the, the using rape as a, as a weapon of war is, is despicable as it is. But in addition, one of the problems with using this as a weapon of war is that even when the war ends, the consequences of this in terms of a human life linger on. And the possibility of hatred being sown, you know, grows and lingers. I mean, just imagine yourself in that situation. How would you feel? So I think this is something that that people forget. And the recommendation of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was that they rec accept the recommendations of the Joint Investigative Report, which was actually issued on 1 November 2021, so that to give human rights and human humanitarian actor, actors access. You know, whether there's a ceasefire or not, as the ambassador said, you know, maybe there won't be one because the, the forces need to exhaust themselves. Um, and then when you look at the human dimension of all of this, I'd just like to say, show you or to speak for one minute if, if you know, if the moderator so allows, you know, to tell you where they are on the development index right now and I mean a few years ago and where this will just make them worse. So if you look at the gender development index as it is Ethiopia ranked 117th out of 129 countries. Um, you know, um, there's this, there are 4.3 million displaced people as of November of this year, and 2.1 million are in the Tigray region, and 52% of these displaced people are women. And so there's a, you know, there's a state of emergency for the whole country, but there is a particularly bad state of emergency when you look at the issue of women. People mentioned the issue of droughts and you have all these climate related disasters, um, the, including the pandemic now, which adds to this and the conflict and you, you know, and the income that women have anyway is so small. And these is, these type of situations just pretty much decimate the, the possibility of women to earn anything. So not only are the men going to die, the women are going to be raped, but then the women have to sustain the country. Uh, in ways that is also impossible with no humanitarian aid and pregnancies. So, you know, looking at the situation as a dire, you know, it's, it's a humanitarian crisis for everybody. But when you look at it through the lens of women, I think anyone with a heart will literally cry. And this you add, you know, you have in the pandemic already, you had a 33% increase in violence against women emotional violence, sexual violence. And may I add for you something that many of you, I'm sure, absolutely do not know, which is that, you know, violence statistics in the censuses take violence from 15 to 49 years of age. So if a woman is 50 and is assaulted or raped, that doesn't even enter your statistics. She's not even good enough to be a number. So you... And the last, the last thing I'd like to say is you have these situations which conflicts are exacerbating beyond belief. And then you have traditional norms which are also terrible and which never get better in these situations. And in some regions, you know, 65% of the women aged 15 to 49 
experience female genital mutilation. And in some regions, it's at 98% of the women. And this is a sort of voluntary passage, but I don't want to go into the gruesomeness of it and how it's done, but it's gruesome and it's, we have to stop it. And from zero to 14, 16% of the girls experience this. So when you have situations of conflict, if this hasn't, you know, if these numbers everywhere are not churning your heart and your stomach, then you can only imagine what conflict is doing to all of this. So I just want to say that, you know, whatever we do, whether it's foreign policy or development work or humanitarian work, whether we do it as individuals, part of groups, um, parts of panels or whatever, I think it, it behooves us to keep this perspective in mind and to speak to it. And, you know, not to wait for UN women personnel to raise the issue of the perspective of women. You know, when women are decimated and destroyed, societies are decimated and destroyed and everybody is. So I just, you know, that's my five cents worth. I would really like to thank for, um, Ambassador Fabian um, for allowing me this time as moderator. And I thank the distinguished panelists and the organizers of this event for, at least for me, what has been a fantastic event. So thank you very much. It's been a real privilege. Thank you, Aparna. You have uh, enriched uh, our webinar, even though you drew attention to some aspects which are most distressing in the present context. And in fact, uh, can we say that we are truly civilized if this is the way the better half of the humanity is being treated? That question remains. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do not see any questions raised. Uh, I would request uh, Sandeep, uh, who has provided us a technical expertise to confirm that. Um, but uh, while waiting for that confirmation, I want to make a few remarks. Uh, one is that uh, Dr. John Cherian drew attention to what is uh, the attitude of the neighbors, that is uh, Sudan and uh, Egypt, uh, especially in the context of the dam, the Renaissance Dam. So is it the case that uh, these two countries would like to see Ethiopia disintegrate? Now, that is one question which uh, I would request uh, all the three panelists to address. And at the same time, I would request them to make their final comments before we conclude. So, would uh, 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 Professor Matthews like to start? Okay, I can try. Uh, I think this is, uh, in fact, another crisis that is going on uh, around uh, Ethiopia, particularly uh, the uh, the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam issue. I think it is uh, by now well known that uh, uh, this uh, issue, I mean, the, the construction of dam uh, started in, 90, uh, in 2011 and it has uh, now taken about uh, uh, nearly 10 years and that the dam is almost coming to uh, coming to a final stage of its uh, construction. It is of course understandable that uh, uh, Egypt has uh, along with uh, also uh, Sudan uh, on the way, Egypt has expressed uh, uh, its concern uh, from the beginning. Uh, and Egypt, of course, uh, rightly or wrongly, feels that if the dam becomes operational, uh, Egypt will suffer in terms of uh, uh, the flow of uh, uh, the downstream uh, flow of the water. And this, of course, uh, will have some, uh, some reality. But of course, Ethiopia always uh, promises that they uh, they are take, trying to take, there will be no shortage of water, uh, even if the dam becomes uh, fully operational, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the issue has been uh, 
debated and uh, discussed and the threats and counter threats have been going on. Now, how far it is going to affect uh, Egypt in a uh, existential manner or how far it is going to affect uh, Sudan? I think uh, the studies are going on, no final conclusion. And the general conclusion is that uh, uh, it, it is not going to affect uh, substantially uh, the flow of uh, uh, the uh, flow of water uh, uh, to the uh, to these countries. And of course, uh, it is understandable that uh, they are concerned with uh, for Egypt, for example, Nile is supposed to be the uh, the lifeblood of uh, the existence of uh, uh, Egypt it's itself, and uh, Egypt has been controlling, uh, controlling the, uh, uh, controlling the Nile for uh, all these years, particularly during the colonial period, and now of course uh, uh, they feel with the construction of the dam they will be affected, and of course there is a long discussion going on both uh, among the diplomats and uh, and the participants from both sides. And no conclusion has uh, yet reached. Uh, Ethiopia has been trying to convince uh, the concerned parties that there nothing is going to happen. But still, Ethiopia will have the residuant power if uh, something uh, you know goes wrong, and it can adversely affect uh, the flow of water and thereby the very existence of uh, Egypt itself. Now, this is uh, an ongoing debate and an ongoing discussion, uh, which of course is, uh, also will have uh, impact on what happens uh, in Ethiopia and uh, what is uh, uh, the attitude of the other powers. Uh, but in my own view, I think uh, uh, the dam may have minor impact on the uh, situation in uh, in Egypt, the agricultural situation, etc. But uh, uh, but as far as uh, uh, as far as the long term impact is concerned, the steps are being being taken, and I think the latest stage of negotiation for on the GERD, the uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, uh, is that uh, uh, they are able to agree on many of the issues. But still, the fear continues, and that fear of Egypt uh, is being expressed uh, in many different ways. One can only hope that uh, uh, this issue uh, doesn't lead to any untoward uh, uh, other uh, developments, and they are able to sort of uh, uh, deal with the problem in an amicable way. I think that is uh, that is the likelihood, though of course the possibilities of other uh, uh, other impact cannot be uh, completely uh, completely ignored. Uh, that is about the uh, about the uh, the GERD issue. What was the other? No, I something? just want only any final comments, if any. Uh, I think I'll reserve my final comments for a little later. Thank you, Professor Matthews. Uh, uh, Ambassador Gurjit Singh, please. Thank you. If you be a little generous to me, let me try and explain something which have come up in the narrative, which I think required a more nuanced understanding. Let's begin with Egypt. The diminishing of Ethiopian power through Harakiri is the best thing Egypt could have hoped for. However, the GERD dam is going nowhere. So diminishing of Ethiopian power does not benefit Ethiopia, I mean Egypt's Nile ambitions. So Egypt finds itself in a conundrum. And what is worse, Egypt's best friends like the UAE are now supporting Addis Ababa for other reasons. So this is troublesome to Egypt because yes, their enemy has been weakened, but their problem is not resolved. Second, Sudan. Sudan was always either here or there, you know, apprehensive of Ethiopian power. But once the civil war broke out, Sudan became the only possible corridor into the Tigray. But Amhara forces moved into Western Tigray, which they believe were Amhara territories, and occupied them. 
टूडे अम्हारा पीपल आर इन वेस्टर्न टिगरे ब्लॉकिंग द लिंक बिटवीन सूडान एंड टिगरे सो टिगरे कैन नॉट ओपन इवन अ ह्यूमैनिटेरियन कॉरिडोर फ्रॉम देयर द सूडनीज लैंड वर टेकन ओवर बाय फार्मर्स फ्रॉम इथियोपिया फॉर मे बी ट्वेंटी थर्टी ईयर्स एंड रन एज एफ इट इज देयर लैंड the sudani seeing the weakness of ethiopia now took those lands and kicked those farmers out that is where this battle with dr john cherry mentioned of ten souls that land has now become troublesome because the amharas are doing precisely what the tigrayans also did to sudan somewhere the tigrayans will consolidate tigray so my understanding of the situation is yes tigray does not want to rule addis ababa they know they can but tigray does not want to be ruled by anybody else they don't want tigray to be invaded again so what you are today seeing the retreat of tigrayan forces to my mind is a gentle nudge to them to get back to tigrayan borders because that is one of the preconditions of addis ababa to start negotiations so i see positive sign in that i don't see the defeat of the army because there are no battles in these towns which are being recovered they are just pulling out and uh, ethiopian national defense forces are going in but they will ultimately strike at amharas occupying western tigray because to them that is tigray and not amhara so this battle between amhara and tigray is something that we need to watch more carefully it is not the traditional oromo tigray battle which is taking place they have become allies at least in a part but the amhara tigray battle is really brutal the third aspect is where do the you see abi amad besides trying to reform his country also tried to reform the axis of power in the horn of africa traditionally it was two american allies Addis Ababa and Nairobi, which ran the affairs of IGAD, the regional organization for the Horn of Africa. Now, what Abi Ahmed did by his opening to Eritrea and then to Somalia, he is trying to sideline Kenya and, to an extent, Djibouti and Sudan. So, this is a new axis: Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea. This the Americans don't like. Last point. i don't think the americans or anybody else for that matter is pro tigray i think there are enough statement to say that they have been equally brutal they also must stop fighting i think the statements out of addis ababa treat anybody calling for peace as equating the two sides and therefore abort so therefore you have all this thing of we are anti american we are anti european anti this to my mind the tigrayans have accepted oba sanjo they have met him the only solution lies in an african solution for the african people where everybody else must come behind oba sanjo oba sanjo has now retreated into a non public diplomacy and i think this is where our hope mainly lies thank you Thank you, Ambassador Gujit Singh. Uh, Dr. John Cherian, please. Yeah, I think uh, you know the the Tigrayans uh, like to think of themselves, you know, as being similar to the Tutsis in uh, in Rwanda. They want to, you know, control Ethiopia. I think that's not possible. Anyway, the Tutsis uh, constitute twenty percent of the population of uh, of Rwanda, while the uh, uh tigray has only 6% of the population but uh, so my fear is that if ethiopia breaks up it could uh, lead to real chaos in the all of africa because sudan too then could you know follow suit there are so many uh, you know groups uh, fighting for autonomy and in darfur the fight for the secession has been going on for quite a long time it could have a ripple effect and of course uh, um the radical groups like the al shabab uh, could uh, strike deeper roots in the in the region you know the uh, you know we were always told that 
Ethiopia was a, a Christian country, but the majority of the population, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I think uh, maybe the majority of the population in Ethiopia is Muslim, not Christian. So, you know, the radic <laughs> radicalism could spread to, uh, to, the, to the region. South Sudan, you know, the civil war can reignite any time. Kenya, you know, there is a Somali uh, secessionist movement there too. They could also, you know, erupt again. So I fear for the future of uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Dr. John Cherian. Uh, uh, would uh, Professor Matthews like to add anything? Because we are about to conclude now. Uh, I think, uh, thank you for the uh, in, very interesting points that has been raised. Uh, and John Cherian just uh, said Ethiopia is, uh, uh, Ethiopia's popular majority is Muslim. I think that is uh, not really correct from whatever I know. And I, I have read that uh, uh, the Christianity is about uh, 60% and the Muslims are uh, uh, maybe around 40%. Uh, this is what, I mean, I have uh, no exact figures. I think that is the situation. But uh, I think it is a fact that Muslims and Christians have been coexisting very peacefully. And uh, in, uh, uh, like in the case of the Prime Minister itself, the um, families in which Christians and Muslims uh, intermarry, live together. And Ethiopia has been sort of a symbol of uh, that way symbol of uh, uh, the various uh, uh, various uh, religious and other groups coexisting, and Ethiopia, of course, when we talk about uh, uh, talk about this crisis in Ethiopia or the unfortunate civil war, of course, Ethiopia has uh, witnessed many civil wars in uh, er in early centuries and in 1974. Uh, the overthrow of Emperor Haile Selassie and then the overthrow of the Derg in 1991. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, issue of civil war is uh, not new to, and I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, they will be also uh, sort of coming to, because there is a limit to any civil war in a poor country to continue, uh, you know, at this level. And from what I know of uh, the uh, Ethiopian trend. I mean, civil wars are no longer uh, a new thing for the country, but I think that they, uh, they will be in a position to deal with the problem uh, sooner than, uh, uh, than later. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, to be, to be frank, from what I read mostly from general, uh, there is a lot of uh, criticism about Ethiopia. And there is, uh, of course, trans uh, taking into account uh, uh, the current crisis and the recent crisis. But I think there is very little which is talked about uh, uh, the recent achievements, economic achievements, and uh, achievements in uh, other areas that Ethiopia has uh, has achieved in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, GDP growth particularly uh, during the Melesenavi period, adopting the, uh, adopting the, uh, the system of, uh, uh, the system of state control and the system of, uh, what is it called? Uh, the, uh, the developmental state model. Ethiopia has made a tremendous economic progress and Ethiopia's uh, economy has been, has been growing tremendously in the, in the past. And of course, uh, an unfortunate development uh, like the civil war uh, will have its impact, but I am sure they will be in a position to deal with uh, uh, deal with the situation. Uh, of course, it may take a, a long time uh, in terms of achieving concrete uh, uh, solution to the problems. And Ethiopia, in fact, has been, in my opinion, I mean, I have been trying to study uh, uh, you know, yeah. a, a, a sort of a very, uh, a very, uh, a force which has been dealing with uh, 
uh, dealing with conflicts in other countries and Ethiopia's role in dealing with the various conflicts uh, in whether it is in Somalia or whether it is in uh, South Sudan or whether it uh, has been quite uh, quite considerable and uh, 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 I, I think uh, Ethiopia is uh, in such a position it should be uh, in a uh, able to deal with the current crisis as well as uh, to overcome the crisis and uh, uh, you know come back to uh, its uh, uh, I mean its uh, its position of uh, prestige and uh, uh, progress as it has been happening uh, and as far as uh, uh, whether Ethiopia will break up I mean it's I think it is very very difficult to say uh, 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 one can only hope. It's already five thirty. I request yeah. you to please. Uh, okay, I, uh, I I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Matthews. Uh, as we have been gently reminded, let us try to conclude. Uh, now, anyone listening to the distinguished speakers will be in two minds. Well, mm -hmm. on the one hand. One is reminded of uh, Matthew Arnold, the Dover Beach. The last line, our love, let us be true to one another for the world which we seems to lie before us like a land of dreams. So various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, set with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. But that's only one part. December is near. It is a season of uh, peace and goodwill. And we believe in the wisdom of the human race. So let us hope that Ethiopia will overcome its present troubles and there will be a new chapter as the new year opens. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a big hand to our distinguished panelists, Professor Matthews, Ambassador Singh, and also to Dr. John Cherian. And also let us thank uh, Tete and also Sandeep, who has made it possible for us to be together in cyberspace. And last but not the least, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us for this webinar. All the best. Thank you.